In this presentation, we're going to be looking at some ethical decision-making models and going over them. And you'll need these for your ethical analysis assignment, where you'll be using and selecting one of these models to follow um, and analyzing the ethical dilemma in the presentation or in the chapter of the, the book that you've chosen to, to analyze. Now it's going to be a quite a long, um, quite a long video, quite a long presentation. So don't just select the first model uh, that you see, but look through and listen to the descriptors of all of the models, and then select the one that best suits the ethical decision or the ethical problem that's that's addressed or implied in the case study that you've selected. So some key components of ethical decision making, and just a reminder that these ethical decision making models are things that not just for this assignment, um, but also are models and processes that you'll be able to use in your profession, and you'll be able to use in your career once you're through school or even in, in your field placements. So learn them, become familiar with them so that you can use them when you're faced with ethical dilemmas that you'll have that you will at some point have to make in your career. So some of the key components of ethical decision making are first to develop social work values based instincts and critical thinking competencies to identify ethical problems and ethical dilemmas. So the first challenge is to be able to identify where there is an ethical dilemma or an ethical problem that you need to to evaluate um, and you'll do that by becoming familiar with the code of ethics wherever you're located um, in the US that's the NASW uh, code of ethics and to and over time and as you become more spend more time in the profession and in practice you'll you'll start to develop these instincts or you you should be developing instincts um, as your knowledge and experience accumulates that allow you to identify when these problems or dilemmas uh, arise. So using the models to decide what to do um, or to guide you towards making that decision and having the moral courage to carry out the decision because some of these ethical dilemmas and problems that we face can be very, very challenging and can really put our our courage and our ability to to follow through on that decision to the test. So the first one we're going to look at is uh, from Elaine Congress and it's the ethic model of decision making and ethic is an acronym that is evaluate, think, hypothesize, identify, and consult. Okay. So the ethic model is an easy to use five step process and it includes examining personal agency client and professional values, thinking about ethical standards and relevant laws, hypothesizing about consequences, identifying the most vulnerable, and consulting with supervisors. So let's take a look at these one on one or one by one. Um, evaluate relevant personal, societal, agency, client, and professional values. So look at who's involved in this ethical dilemma and then evaluate the values for each of those subsystems that are part of the, 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 part of the ethical dilemma. Think about what ethical standard of the NAS code of Eth NASW code of ethics applies. If you're within the United States, if you're in another location, whatever code of ethics applies to you in your practice, as well as relevant laws and case decisions. So you don't need to be a legal expert. Um, however, you should have a general familiarity with the, the law and with precedent in your area of specialty or your area of practice. Um, so think about those and how they relate to the ethical dilemma or problem that you're that you're considering um, at this time. Hypothesize about possible consequences of different decisions. And again, there are different each of the subsystems that you're looking at and that are affected by or affected by 
this ethical dilemma or ethical problem, there can there are possible consequences for each of those. So what are the consequences for the client if depending on your decision or your course of action, the consequences for you as a practitioner in your professional uh, career, the consequences for the agency, the consequences for the community, if it's involved and so on. So, so think about what, based on your decision or your choice not to make a decision and not to take action, what are the consequences of both? Who will, be be who will benefit and who will be harmed um, in view of our commitment as social workers to the most vulnerable. And then finally, consult with your supervisor and colleagues about the most ethical choice. For those working in rural areas um, where it may be, where there may not be access to a social work supervisor, um, bring that information to, to whoever is in your chain of command um, or to colleagues that you may be able to reach out to through um, through a professional network, if there is one in your area, about what the ethical choice would be. And again, keep in mind as you consult with colleagues outside of your agency that you need to have the client or the system that you're working with their confidentiality in mind and carefully protect that as well, particularly in smaller rural areas where it can be very easy to identify an individual with a small amount of information. So that's the ethic model. Now we're going to move on to the six question or six Q model of ethical decision making from Strom Gottfried. And this one, as the name says, six questions. Uh, so you'll be asking yourself six questions when faced with this dilemma. The first one is who will be helpful in making the decision? So who's going to be able to help you make that decision? Is it supervisors, colleagues, specialists? Are there resources within your organization? Are there others who can help you understand the, the, de the details of the decision, the potential impacts um, and consequences and so on? So ask yourself the second question, when have I faced a similar dilemma? So in your professional experience, have you ever dealt with a similar ethical dilemma or ethical problem? And if you have, then what did you decide then? How is that the same and how is it different? And how might it influence your decision and what was the outcome? So was the outcome what you expected and what you had hoped for or was the outcome something completely different and there were unexpected consequences. Um, where do, the third question, where do ethical, clinical, and legal guidelines lead me? So are there re regulations, policy, or laws that apply to this situation? So depending on where you're practicing, does your state, county, um, community um, have, whatever jurisdiction you're in, are there laws on the books or their policies or written regulations that apply to this situation and send you in a legal direction. What standards of the NASW Code of Ethics apply? Again, if you're in the United States, the NASW Code of Ethics. If you're in another jurisdiction, um, the jurisdiction that would apply to you. And if there is a conflict between the regulations, policies, and laws, seek supervision um, in our profession, the code of ethics uh, supersedes that, but you also have to obey the law. And that would involve a an analysis or, or um, involve you considering the consequences of, of what would happen if the code of ethics provides a different route than the regulations, laws, or policies, and what the consequences to you may be, as well as to your to your client and to your organization. What professional knowledge is useful in guiding you towards a decision? So looking at the human lifespan, human development, also looking at um, best practices and what would lead towards the most positive outcome and beneficial outcome towards your client or the system and and systems involved in in this ethical dilemma question four what are your choices 
So what can you, what are the things you can decide to do? Do you need any more information than that you have to make the decision? Do you need any more context? And again, what are alternative decisions you could make? And what are the consequences? And how urgent is the situation? And if it's a life-threatening situation and someone's safety is at risk, then it's an extremely urgent situation. It's going to require you to make a choice and a decision quite quickly. If it's um, less urgent, then you have time to consider more the consequences, the alternatives, and, and look at the information and gather additional information. Um, it may be a multi-step decision process where you have to take immediate action to address the urgency of an immediate situation where someone's safety is at risk and then you have that will give you some time to consider carefully consider the the following steps and the following actions that you need to make to address this uh, ethical dilemma so the fifth question is why are you choosing this course of action so what's your motivation in selecting that course of action? Be aware of transference, counter-transference. Be aware of, of any personal influence on your decision from past experience, personal experience, past cases, and so on. Does it pass the publicity test? Um, this it, Does it pass the golden rule test? The, quote unquote smell test, right? Does does the decision or your course of action, does it feel right, right? Um, you can consult a mentor or supervisor to, to ask their opinion on your chosen course of action. Um, and so the last question here in this model is how should I enact my decision? What's the process? It may be that there's regulation and law that that outlines and, and dictates what the process is, such as reporting a case to Child Protective Services or Adult Protective Services. What social work knowledge and skills will you need to use? And wh where and how do you document the decision? So following your agency's protocol and legal requirements for documentation, but also keeping in mind the confidentiality and protecting your clients when when documenting your decisions and who has and will have access to to the documentation that you're writing okay the next model we're going to talk about is the American Counseling Association approach to ethical decision making um, this comes from Forrester Miller and um, Van Hoos um, in Paradise um, and is a has been around for for quite a while and this is from the American Counseling Association we'll look at it um, apply it where it can be applied to social work so when counselors are faced with ethical dilemmas that are difficult to resolve they're expected to engage in a carefully considered ethical decision-making process reasonable differences of opinion of opinion can and do exist among counselors with respect to the ways in which values ethical principles and ethical standards would be applied when they can't conflict while there is no specific ethical decision-making model that is most effective counselors are expected to be familiar with a credible model of decision-making that can bear public scrutiny and its application so this focuses because it is from a counselors uh, association applies primarily to private practice micro level social work practice but can also be applied to to larger systems so there are seven steps in the ACA approach to decision making um, identify the problem apply the code of ethics the one that applies to you for us as social workers in the U.S., it's the National Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics. Determine the nature of the dimensions of the dilemma. Generate potential courses of action. Consider the potential consequences of all of your options. And then choose a course of action. Evaluate the course of action afterwards and then implement it. So, so your seven basic steps. Um, it's important to realize different professionals 
may implement different courses of action in the same situation. So ethical decision making is you have guidelines and you have what you the best course of action but the best course of action is is sometimes subjective and so different professionals can interpret things differently and often there's not one right answer in a complex uh, dilemma or complex problem if you follow a systematic model and you can give a professional explanation so if you follow the model you can you'll be able to provide a professional explanation for the course of action you chose and then make sure to document um, in some way or in an appropriate location how you arrived at the decision that you made because if it comes into under question or under scrutiny at a future date then you're going to want to be very very clearly able to articulate why you chose a course of action you chose and that protects your clients and protects you as a as a professional um, from 1979 a counselor is probably acting in an ethically responsible way concerning a client if he or she has maintained personal and professional honesty has the best interests of the client has made that decision without malice or personal gain and can justify their actions as the best judgment of what should be done based on the current state of the profession. So when you're looking at the code of ethics from the NASW, for example, you wanna make sure that, that you're utilizing the most recent version of the code of ethics. So Reamer and Conrad, this is a common one in, used in in social work and essential steps for ethical problem solving. So the Reamer model of decision making, there are six steps that we'll go through one by one. So first you wanna determine whether there is an ethical issue or dilemma. So is there, is this an ethical dilemma or is it not? And then is there a conflict of values, of rights, of pro professional responsibilities? So if there is, then you want to identify the key values and the principles involved. So what meaning and limitations are attached to these competing values? Then you want to rank those which in your professional judgment are most relevant to the issue or dilemma. And what reasons can you provide for prioritizing um, one over another? Develop an action plan consistent with the ethical priorities that have been determined as central to the dilemma. So once you've ranked them, develop an action plan that addresses those more important ones or those that you've determined are more relevant first. Have you conferred with clients, colleagues, um, again, as appropriate about the risks and consequences and alternative courses of action? Um, and how, can you support or justify your plan with the principles and values on which the plan's based? So again, it's important that you are able to provide clear support for the plan that you choose when, once you've identified this ethical dilemma. Then implement your plan. Use the most appropriate practice skills and competencies for the, the context of the situation. And how are you gonna make use of core social work skills such as sensitive communication, skillful negotiation, cultural responsiveness, cultural sensitivity to, to implement this plan? Reflect on the outcome. So how were the, what were the consequences? What was the outcome of, of your decision on clients, the client or clients, the professionals involved and any agency or agencies that were part of your decision-making process. And then again, as with all these others, make sure that you have, have your process documented. Um, some additional things to be aware of with the Reamer model is there may be an issue of self-determination of an adolescent versus the well-being of the family. So, 
and also when working with minors there's the issue of self-determination versus um, emancipation or the the legal status of a of a minor within a family system and within society as a whole confidentiality so rarely is confidential information held in absolute secrecy however decisions about access by third parties are worked out with the client so the client still needs to it, and there are cases and you know as mandatory reporters there are instances where we're re, where we are required to break confidentiality however typically sharing uh, confidential information and sensitive information about a client needs to be approved by the client um, it needs to be included in either in the rele a release of information that they will sign to authorize the sharing of that content. Um, so what if your client's right to choose a beneficial course of action brings hardship or harm to others who would be affected? That's, uh, that's something you need to be prepared to address and, and be aware of. Um, have you conferred with all the necessary persons regarding the ethical dimensions of planning for a a, vic a victim of a domestic violence survivor's quest to secure secret shelter and the implication for her teenage children, uh, particularly a, a woman who has teenage uh, sons, then there may be a difficulty with some shelter placements that may not allow uh, teenage boys to, to be in a a domestic violence shelter so so consult with everyone bef who needs to be consulted with and as part of implementing your decisions um, and the plan before you hit go on the plan um, skillful colleague and supervisory communication and negotiation may enable a colleague to an impaired colleague to see their impact on clients and take appropriate action so you may be in a situation where you see either emotional mental health substance um, something else is impacting a, a colleague's ability to to take the best course of action with with clients and you need to be able as a colleague our code of ethics mandates that you address the issue with the colleague and supervision before moving up the chain of command provided you feel safe doing so um, so for this one review the the code of ethics section that applies to to our responsibilities to colleagues um, there's also most states and most jurisdictions have an ethics review committee or an ethics consultation process. If your jurisdiction does not, then if you're a member of NASW, the national office has access to an ethics consultation process that you can take advantage of. Steinman, Richardson, and McEnroe ethical decision-making process. So moving on to this one there's this is another seven step process um, and the first thing you need to do before you start these seven steps is identify what the problem is so once you identify the problem um, take these seven steps identify the ethical standard involved and you'll see these repeated in some of the others there's echoes of some of the other models um, what are the codes or laws that apply? If there are no codes or laws that are being violated, why is it a problem? Why is it an ethical dilemma? And determine the ethical traps. So some ethical traps include the belief there's an easy common sense or objective solution, which common sense is common to the person that thinks it's common sense not necessarily to, to others involved in the situation. Conflicting values between personal and religious values, professional values, the values of the social worker and the client, and so on. The circumstances are so unique that they must be taken into consideration. So this is trying to, trying to find justification for not taking action often 
um, and and can be a, a slippery slope like well in this one case this doesn't apply but um, and confusion about who's going to benefit from the decision so be careful not to fall in these in these traps and to identify any others that may be present frame a preliminary spot response to the ethical problem or dilemma so first what does the code of ethics and what does the law say you should do in this case so the law specifies when you should report um, to child protective services or adult protective services most jurisdictions will have if you're if you're worried and unsure uh, many jurisdictions will have a you can do a what if call what if this is the situation do i need to make a report um, are there any circumstances that should influence the response so and then what's your preliminary response so you can take circumstances into account but just be careful that they don't ultimately affect or risk the safety of those involved. Um, so for example, if a single mother is, is, has a substance abuse issue and problem and needs to, to go to inpatient treatment, what, what's the consequence of her children, for her children? particularly if there are no family members and no one to, to care for them if she goes into inpatient treatment. Is an intensive outpatient program uh, another option and so on. So, so look at the circumstances and then um, when you see those or identify those circumstances, see if they look at your alternatives. Consequences, and again, we just talked, addressed uh, that um, a, a short time ago. What's gonna, what will happen if you take the action? What are the short and long-term consequences? So the short-term consequences of someone going to an inpatient treatment program, as an example, may be that they are able to address their addiction and you know, begin treatment and begin the recovery process. A long-term consequence may be that if they're in treatment for 30 days, 90 days, they're not gonna have employment when they get out and that's gonna increase the risk of, of of relapse once they're once they're out of the that protected environment. Any unintended consequences that you like you can identify, um, and are the consequences ethically defensible? So if there are going to be consequences to the course of action to address the initial um, ethical dilemma, are the consequences ethical? Can you defend what those consequences are? Um, prepare an ethical resolution. So look at the situation, including the relevant circumstances. What ethical codes or laws are involved? What do those codes or laws suggest you do? Or tell you that you do? Um, and if you've consulted with colleagues, supervisors, ethic boards, um, what is their suggestion? and the consequences of taking the action on the client, on yourself, on your employer, others in the community. And so taking all of these considerations into mind, make your proposal. And this is how we will resolve our ethical dilemma. Give feedback, discuss your, your decision with your supervisor or respected peer. If there are legal issues involved, um, if you're in an agency, talk to them about um, if they have a lawyer and talking to their lawyer um, or finding an attorney, there is access again through NASW to legal consultation um, if you're an NASW member. And use feedback to amend your resolu resolution, re amend your decision as needed. And once you've followed all of this, take action. The next model we're going to look at is the Dolgoff, Lohenberg, and Harrington, a general decision-making model. So Dolgoff has said, ethical decision-making is far too complex to permit the development of a simple how-to problem-solving model. 
Model is a permissible didactic device as long as it is understood that in real life every decision is preceded and followed by other decisions, many of which have a direct bearing on the matter under consideration. So this is the most, if you've noticed, we've gone from the, the more direct basic um, models to, to this one, which is the most complex and involved. So while I would not recommend using this model for this for your ethics assignment for your court for this course i would uh, suggest that you do be familiar with it and have it in mind as an option later in your career so still go through look at this and if you choose to to use this one that is that's fine so this is an 11 step process um, and we'll go through those one at a time So step one, identify the problem and factors that contribute to its maintenance. Identify all of the persons and institutions involved in this problem. So clients, victims, support systems, um, formal and informal support systems, other professionals, and anyone else involved. Who should be involved in the decision-making process? So of all the individuals, groups, institutions involved, who, who should be part of the, the process of making the decision on how to respond to the ethical dilemma? Identify the values relevant to the problem by the participants in step two, and including the clients and workers. So you're also going to look at your own values that are relevant to the problem and, and make sure that your values are not affecting your decision here. Identify the goals and objectives um, which attainment you may resolve or reduce the problem. If harm reduction is a goal, if you can't eliminate harm, and harm reduction becomes the goal, right? So it won't eliminate the problem, but it will reduce it. Alternate, alternate intervention strategies and targets. So always have a backup or an alternate when you're looking at this. Um, as opposed to just one single decision and plow straight ahead, right? Because again, um, as I mentioned earlier, if it's an urgent life-threatening situation, you will need to make an immediate decision and take action. And with that in mind to, to get you some time to, to frame an appropriate, well thought out, reflective um, course of action. Select the most appropriate strategy, implement your strategy, monitor it, and watch for unanticipated consequences and evaluate the results and identify additional problems. So this is really a conglomeration of all the other models together because you see a lot, of, a lot of steps and suggestions that are included in the other models um, that are brought together here. Um, one valuable th uh, thing that Dolgoff um, and his colleague and colleagues have have put forth here there was an ethical assessment screen and so to the idea of this is to help further clarify and integrate the ethical aspect of decision making and social work practice so so it's steps you can take to to make sure your assessment is is strong and that your decisions are on which actions to take are strong so um Identifying your own relevant personal values in relation to this ethical dilemma. Identify any societal values that are relevant to the decision to be made. And then relevant professional values and ethics. And then minimizing conflicts between personnel, societal, and profession personal, societal, and professional values. Identify alternative ethical options you can take. And which of the alternative actions will protect your clients and others' rights? and welfare and which will protect society's rights and interest and to minimize conflicts between your clients others and society's rights and interests um, and yours which alternative action will result in doing the least harm and what extent will alternative actions be efficient effective and ethical and consider have you considered and weighed the short and long-term ethical consequences of of your decision and of your 
course of action. So the ethical rules screen provides a step to help social workers understand that the code of ethics takes precedence over your own personal values. So it's relevant to counselors and marriage and family therapists as well. So your own personal values are not, do not take precedent over the, the code of ethics. The ethical guidelines outlined in the code are those that you agree to as a professional. And this can be challenging, but as, as we've seen in each of the, the models, that's something that you need to take into account and be aware of and not allow your own personal ethical beliefs or personal beliefs to impact the course of action you take in your client's best interests. So a social worker has done an ethical self-assessment, such as the one provided ab above in the previous slide, will have a better appreciation of the values that are personal values versus those that are your professional values. So the ethical rules screen suggests that if one or more provisions of the code apply, then you should follow the code. The code does not cover the specific issue or if there are conflicting provisions within the code, um, Dolgoff offers a way to rank the provisions of the code as they apply to that particular situation in the ethical principles screen, which we saw in the previous slide. Since the NASW code of ethics does not place one particular value principle or standard above another, and recognizes there will be reasonable differences of opinion, it's important that you, as a social worker attempting to apply any decision-making model, have a justifiable, justifiable approach for how you've ranked those principles. So, so you have to be able to justify your decision. So the ethical rules screen, examine the code of ethics to determine if any code rules, any of the code rules are applicable. And these rules take precedence over the worker's personal value system. If one or more of the code rules apply, follow the code rules. And if the code does not address the specific problem or several, several code rules provide conflicting guidance, use the ethical principle screen to, to attempt to gain clarification on the situation. And the ethical principles screen, um, protection of life, quality and inequality, autonomy and freedom, least harm, quality of life, privacy and confidentiality, truthfulness and full disclosure. So that you look at all of these as, as part of your screening process um, if, you're, if you're uncertain which way to go. So does your decision protect life, ensure equality and equality and so on. So that's a number of ethical decision-making models. You'll select one of those and apply it to the case study that you've chosen and good luck in your assignment.